third party content has been copied and communicated pursuant to Part 5A or 5B of the Copyright Act, unless indicated otherwise. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Sorry we were, we, uh, were running a little bit late, but uh, this university is growing so rapidly that uh, our DVCR got lost. <laughs> but ultimately found it. Well, it's not, it's not that Peter can't keep up with things uh, happening here. It's just that something was entered wrongly in his diary. But Peter made it. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Peter Hudson, that's, so that's our DVCR, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research, to uh, introduce uh, our guest of today. So, Peter, please come forward. Thanks, Marcel, and uh, welcome, everybody. And my apologies for um, went to the wrong venue. So I've been going from one end of the campus to the other end of the campus. But it's a great pleasure to be here, and good to see a nice audience turn out today for Dr. Russell Schnell. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wathaurong people of the Kulin Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land which we are gathered today, and we repay our respects to them for the care of the land. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, Marcel, who is an Alfred Deakin Professor of the University, which is one of our most prestigious professors. And um, I want to welcome you all to this wonderful event today. Um, our speaker is the eminent climate scientist Nobel Peace Prize co-recipient, Dr. Russell Schnell. Um, looking at Russell's um, CV, it's very varied, <laughs> both geographically as well as topically as well. So it's really a great pleasure to see, to welcome you here to Geelong. Is this your first time to Geelong? Or? Yes, thank you. Okay. And um, so I welcome you all as well to this uh, wonderful event. The Centre for Integrative Ecology is one of the special research centres of the university. So we have 13 special research centres, which basically are areas of research strength, and Marcel and his team have really taken, I think, what was a, dare I say, a slightly disparate group of people and brought them together in a really nice way. Which, uh, they're making some significant contributions to the, to the research of uh, Deakin University and adding to a very topical agenda in the world today. I think that um, you know, sustainable development and the environment um, you know, sometimes it gets, we sort of glaze over because we hear so much about the environment and so forth, um, the problems of the environment. But I think what the group in Deakin has been doing, and also I know what Russell's been doing, is really trying to pick out what are the key things where we can actually make a significant difference. And I think that what we're trying to do is really trying to solve, I guess, what we call the wicked problems, the big problems of society as we go forward now. And I guess it's sort of interesting to me, I'm a, for those that know, I'm an engineer and material scientist. Um, I still find it strange that uh, people see you know, climate change and global warming you know, as in the future, not problems we have now. And to me it's really you know, the wrong way, wrong way to look at these things. And so I think that um, I think it's very important that we do look at the impacts as they are occurring now as indicators for the future. And if we don't change our habits, really, of polluting the air and contributing to global warming, we're going to see lots of changes. We're already seeing changes, you know, I think, in our climates and so forth. One of the things that um, we're doing some YouTube searching of Russell as well, and uh, I think that um, one clear thing that comes through is that um, he's a very clear communicator. And I think for these complex problems, sometimes people can glaze over. And what we need is really people who actually stand up and clearly communicate quite complex problems such that people can understand and take it on board. And I believe that you've done exceptionally well in doing that so far. Um, and so I think that, um, as I said, basically he's a leading scientist who has successfully communicated his work in many places. Um, he's spoken to thousands of people in his career already. And... Um, and he is a recipient of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Scientific Communicator Award for his clear communication on this particularly important event. He is the director of many numerous projects and scientific institutions and has authored more than 150 publications. 
and he's currently director, deputy director of the Global Monitoring Division of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I think it's really what comes clear from the, the reading I've done and some research on the web is that um, his creativity, enthusiasm, and really the ability to simplify very complex environmental issues was really added to the debate, which I think is really important and timely at this stage. So, ladies and gentlemen, please wel welcome Dr. Russell Schnell to the, give his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's uh, an honor to be here. I assume we should be out of here within less than an hour. Is that correct? <laughs> okay. You've all looked at a globe like this many times. Many times. But how many times have you turned it up and looked at it this way? What don't you see? There's very little land in the southern hemisphere. Very little. It's all up here. And that means then that that's where people live, that's where vegetation is, that's where most of the energy consumption is, so that means that's where pollution is. And that circum part of the world is controlling the world's atmosphere, as you'll see, the composition changing. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> there's going to be a couple you thought there was no exams left, but there's a couple exams yet you have to pass. And there are some questions I'd like you to consider. If I put my hand over Australia, where we are here, and you're a teacher in school and you say, okay students, there's the globe, this big, draw how thick the world's atmosphere is. And I want you to Vote. I'm going to bring my hand down, and you shout out, don't be shy, when you think it, that we're at the top of 95% of the world's atmosphere, okay? Remember, you're the teacher now, and you want the two students to draw how thick the world's atmosphere is. It's as thick as two of my gray hairs. <gasps> oh, that's not much, is it? In real terms, that's about 10,000 meters thick. And I'm going to move this down. I think it's a little loud, isn't it? 10,000 meters, 95% of all the world's air. That's not very thick. When you fly in a commercial aircraft, 95% of the air is beneath you. Think about that. So the first thing is there's not much air in the world. And that air moves around. You put up something here today, and in a few days it's going to be out in the ocean somewhere. Or if China puts up something, pollution, in about four days it'll be at Hawaii. Another four days, U.S. The U.S. puts up its pollution, it goes to Europe. Europe goes to Russia. Russia goes to China. All around. We all live in somebody else's sewer. Keep that in mind. We all live in an atmospheric sewer. Now, so we've done question number one. How about question number two? When you burn a gallon, or no, here it's a liter, a liter of petrol, how much does that liter weigh? You all know. <laughs> Same as water. A liter weighs, what, 2.2 kilos or something like that. You know? Less? One kilo. I'm oh, sorry. I gave something away. Now, when you burn that, that kilo, how many kilos of carbon dioxide do you produce? Is it good? Four, three, depends how efficient you're burning. Three or four, you know your basic chemistry, yeah. That, think about that. All of the coal, oil, natural gas we're burning, on average, produces three to four times its own weight in carbon dioxide. And some of you are saying, oh, come on. Basic chemistry. You have this petrol, which is made up of carbon and hydrogen, all hooked together. 
and you add this big heavy oxygen molecule to get your energy out, all of a sudden you're adding two of them to one carbon molecule. There's your weight. Okay. Question number three. Now, I, I made an error here. Uh, could that Indian, to the gentleman in the back, stand up just for a second? I want to see what size. This, this sounds strange, but I have prizes. There's a, a shirt from Noah. Pass it up to the gentleman. And who, who, I didn't hear somebody telling me how thick the atmosphere was, but how thick was it? Did somebody really say it was that thin? Come on, don't be shy. We got lots of prizes here. <laughs> be honest, did somebody really think that the atmosphere was so thin? Raise your hand. There's a gentleman smiling here. He must know what it was. Okay, we'll try another one later. How long does it stay in the atmosphere? Hours? Days? Weeks? Months? Years? Decades? Eons? Let's hear it loud. Eons. A long time. So, you're about an adult size, I think. <laughs> Here's an adult Noah t-shirt, fresh from Colorado for you. Why do we care? In simple terms, why do we care? Come on. Greenhouse. How is it a greenhouse though? Give me a simple explanation of what that means. I'm sorry, say again. Okay. Let me give you a real simple explanation. The atmosphere is heated not from the sun above, but from the earth below. The sun comes through, it hits the ground or the ocean, changes long wave, radiates the heat out. But that heat doesn't completely disappear into space, does it? It's held there by this blanket. This blanket is made up of carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, a few other chemicals. Each of those little molecules is like a feather in a feather bed. It holds a little bit of heat. So if you add more feathers to your feather bed, when you get in, it's going to be warmer, isn't it? We have added probably 50% more feathers, either down to the atmosphere in the last two or 300 years than used to be there. So you've got all of these feathers in there. There's only one thing that can happen. The atmosphere is going to hold more heat. Now that heat's going to go a couple of places. Mostly it's going to go into the ocean. Remember, most of the world is ocean. And that's a huge reservoir where the heat is, much of the heat is going. It's not all going there, but eventually that heat is going to come back out. But the heat is also warming the ocean, which caused it to expand. So you're going to get sea level rise two ways. What melts, or I'm sorry, as it heats, it's going to expand, but something else. Now here's a prize. In Antarctica, how thick is the ice in the center and around? Come on, take a guess. It's a free t-shirt coming here. <laughs> how much? More than a couple of kilometers. No, you're just guessing now. You don't get a prize. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. What? No. I need it in meters or feet or miles. Five thousand. Five thousand what? <laughs> meters. That's about five kilometers. No, too too high. 
I think. Wait, now you're pretty close. <laughs> I work in the British system, and I don't do that well. It's two miles, which is right on, well, close. Two miles must be what, six, five kilometers? What, three? But that gentleman was brave, and he stood. <laughs> Stand up so I could see your size. Here's an extra large. <laughs> There's your extra large. Yes, the ice is very thick in Antarctica. Antarctica is a continent. Underneath all that ice, there's a, a lot of land, mountains and lakes. Yeah, there's lakes under Antarctica. The water is at the base of the ice sheet is melted, and there's lakes down there. Pretty interesting. Anyway, now let's talk about the Arctic. The Arctic is quite different. The Arctic is water surrounded by land. Antarctica is land surrounded by water. So the ice up here is floating. And as the ice melts here, how much does it raise the sea level? Don't be shy, come on. What? There's the man, he wins a t-shirt. Zero. It's just like an ice cube floating in a bottle or glass. So the ice in the Arctic is disappearing each spring and summer, as you can see. What size shirt? <laughs> Adult medium? There you are. Thank you. But if that doesn't fit, I have a larger one for you. OK. So. We've got these two different stories, of course, and keep that in mind. When you hear about the Arctic ice cap melting, it's not adding any ocean water. Antarctica melting, yes. Greenland melting, yes. Greenland is also two miles thick. Something just gave up. Oh. Greenland is two miles thick of ice also. And Greenland ice is going down quite fast, too. So keep those little tidbits in your mind. Now let's go and do it. A little more interesting talk here now. Um, look at these numbers. Each person eats roughly 24 calories a day. The average US citizen uses 240,000 calories a day. And the average Australian about 200,000. Sorry? I'll just try to, to you, you continue. Oh. Try to change the lighting a little bit. Okay. So what do we use these calories for? More, uh, very few of them go to food. Most of them go for transport, cooling, heating, pumping, plowing, you name it, freezing, etc. It's like having each person here in this room has a hundred servants working for you 24 hours a day. Think about that. And those servants are generating the electricity, they're transporting, they're making your food in winter. You get food from all over the world. We live in the U.S. Winter, we get strawberries in the middle of the winter. We get kiwi from where? Probably New Zealand or from here. Watermelon gets flowing in. It's pretty neat, eh? But we're using a huge amount of energy to do that. And this energy comes basically from three or four sources. The real big ones are oil, coal, and natural gas. And all of those gases, oil, coal, and natural gas, were in the atmosphere. 100,000, million years ago, you name it. But what has happened is the plants and plankton took all that CO2 out, put, made biomass. Biomass settled down in the bottom of the oceans generally. It was covered by silt. Pretty soon, you, well, pretty soon, millions of years, we had coal and oil. And then that is going back into the atmosphere now. So all we're doing is taking something that nature did and took out in millions of years, we're putting it back in fast. Right, you get, a, you get a shirt for that. I don't want to ask the lady. <laughs> if this one is too large or too small, let me know. I have some more here. So we're, we're doing an experiment that nature did very slow, and we're really accelerating it. And 
we can almost predict what's going to happen, but not quite. So let me show you some of the stuff we do know. Oh, Asia uses 25%, approximately 25% energy per capita than the U.S. does. It's because of smaller houses generally, more efficient uh, use of energy, not so many cars, but they're coming up very fast. If any of you have been to China in the last few years, it's pretty amazing. Eight lane highways, traffic jams both ways, big buildings, huge, GDP going up. Well, let me show you what we, how we know what's happening in the atmosphere. This is a, a network we have, a global network. Um, including Cape Grim here on Tasmania. There's a very good station on Tasmania, and I'll tell you a little more about it. But where each of these red dots are, every Tuesday morning, somebody goes and fills two two-liter bottles of air. And it takes a week to learn how to fill a bottle of air without you coughing, farting, spitting, using cologne to screw it up. And it's very expensive for us to send two bottles to all of these places every week and get any of them back screwed up. So we put a lot of time and effort to make sure that it's done right. And we also have ships going along every five degrees taking samples. Where you see the blue stars, we have aircraft every week or two fly as high as they can, sampling all the way up and down. And where the green triangles are, there's towers. The blue, circle, blue squares is where we have manned stations where people live and work. Uh, measuring continuously in the atmosphere. And at Cape Grim, there's also a very good station. But here's some of the U.S. stations. This is Mauna Loa, Hawaii. Uh, this is Summit, Greenland. This is not where people live. This is just where our instruments are. Um, South Pole, Antarctica, Cape uh, or Samoa, Trinidad Head, and Point Barrow, Alaska. This is where the, we have instruments a whole labs full of instruments and people living there working. Uh, look closely at Antarctica. There, people there are locked up for a year and about one in ten have psychiatric problems uh, being locked up for so long. And this particular one, we went to put, pull one of the guys out. He was, everything had to be ordered either in color or size. Look at the bottles here. They're all measured by height, and they go from small to high. Then they have the colors and the colors, and everything is just it like that. And inside the lab, all of the tools were laid out by size and form and shape. <laughs> he was a good scientist, but he, he, slipped, <laughs> he slipped a couple cogs. During, he's okay now. <laughs> now, here's the excellent station that Tas, uh, in, um, CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology have at Cape Grim in Tasmania. There's all, you can see the wind farms at the back. This is very uninhabited. It's a beautiful location. If you ever have a chance to go there, um, you, you should. There's not many visitors they get. And the people work there and then they sample. The air comes down these towers. And this is a, the next land to the south is Antarctica. So this is some of the cleanest best air on earth comes into this station here. And we work very closely with these people. Um, NOAA has six global networks measuring different things like this. I showed you the first one, which was trace gases, or just carbon dioxide and a few others. This is for aerosols. These are dust and dirt and volcanic dust and field dust and whatever you want to call it. And this this is a network, it's, it's more, uh, a federated network where we have our equipment but other people run them and that way politically we can have one, two, three, four, four stations in China and we get the data uh, in real time which is pretty amazing but then just to check up on the Chinese we have uh, uh, four stations uh, in Korea and Taiwan and others around there just to see what's because China is a really big player in the global aerosol if you've ever seen pictures of Beijing in the winter sometimes, it can be pretty polluted. And that, all, that stuff doesn't stay there, it moves. And, and it moves around the earth. So to understand how it affects climate, which it does, we have to, to keep monitoring that. Um, just one picture to show you, the, the hardest station we have is Summit Greenland. Because it's so friggin' cold there, 
like minus 60 and you have to work outside a lot. And you, this is a balloon, this is a night picture uh, and these are lights that I showed you, but actually it's totally dark there and this balloon is going up to study ozone. And about six years ago, there's only five people there that live there and stay there. We had five women running the station. They were the cat driver, the diesel mechanic, the doctor, the cook and the scientist and it's the best data we've ever had. There was no arguments, there was no fights, there was everything worked. So um, we're still trying to recruit another crew but um, we haven't been successful. So the crew has shifted out um, uh, twice a year. We can get in there uh, in the winter from Iceland with aircraft. But, but you can get five, you can get two meters of snow in one storm. It might last four to six days and then when you come out, these buildings for instance could be snowed right up to there and you see that? That's a, a, a place to get out when the snow is really deep. But this, this is early in the year uh, before the snows come in spring. But in the, in the spring there'll be snow right up to there. How do we do the sampling? This, these are bottles that we have. They're very clean, they're glass bottles and we pump air into them uh, with remote or with pumps that you, you hold your breath, you go and you turn it on and you run away and it has a long inlet line. And we also do them in pairs. And the reason for that is that when we measure what's in there, they have to agree exactly or we, we know there's something wrong. And we also then put in a poisoned air, an air that is, act, there's nothing like it on earth. And if we get any of those molecules back, we know it wasn't flushed out. Because the time that these bottles get prepared, cleaned, shipped to, to all kinds of places, we've probably got anywhere up to 200 to a thousand dollars invested in each bottle. And we just can't afford to to have problems. And then when they come back, look at all these tanks. We have to measure them and every measurement, not every bottle, every measurement on each species is calibrated twice. So on one of these bottles, if we're doing 50 different gases, we'll do at least a hundred calibrations just on that bottle and then move to that one. And that's what these tanks are. We make up very, very accurate standard gases and then measured against, in our building we have 7,000 of these tanks because you make up a standard and then you've got to keep it for a while and make sure it isn't changing and then as the atmosphere changes you've got to ch change it and you've got to keep it and it's just incredible. It's just, you can imagine it, it, it's a, a logarithmic uh, growth in this. But you've got to do that because when we put out a number we want it to be trusted 50 years from now and we want the data 50 years from now to be able to be exactly traced back to what was here and also we've been doing this for 56 years. The data we did 50 years ago, we have absolute confidence that those numbers are the same as we're doing today, measured the same way. The concentrations will be different but we trust those numbers and that's uh, what we do. We don't do any climate predictions, we don't do anything uh, beyond making the measurements because we would cheat. I'm going to tell you honestly, uh, 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 um, scientists are like anybody else. If they have a, a million and two numbers and one of them is a little out, they might rub it out or push the number a little bit to make their story. We don't do that. We just make the numbers and they're all public. You can go on the internet and some of our, our numbers are available within uh, three or four hours of our collecting them and we put them all out there and whatever, whatever they show is what the way it is. We also have tall towers I mentioned so we can measure the vegetation uptake of CO2 and the pollution. We have aircraft and these little uh, bottles, there's, a, there's 12 of them or 14 depends on the pack and the pilot flies and there's a little readout says, good morning pilot, hope you had a good night, fly to X, Y and Z. He flies there, takes a sample, it says good, sample's good, go to somewhere else and, and we pre-program where we want him to sample both in height and location. It comes, never even opens the box, puts it back in FedEx, next morning we get it or two days later and we have 250 of these in motion uh, on any single day. And I forgot to tell you, of the flasks we have 20,000 moving uh, around the world every day. Uh, it's a big operation. Now let's look at some data, finally. This is Cape Grim data for carbon dioxide 
and for methane. These are the two main greenhouse gases. And uh, pick where you were born. A lot of you were born probably somewhere in here. Some, most of us were born over here. But look at, in 1980, there was 300 and, or three, 335 parts per million, and today we're past 400. And this gas is going to stay here a long time. These are a lot of eiderdown feathers in that blanket. And as this goes up, you can see in the next curve, I'll show you, it's going up faster and faster. It's not a straight line. You draw a straight line here, it comes out here. It's faster and faster each year because more people on Earth, higher GDP, cheaper energy. Man, energy in the U.S. now is getting real cheap because of all of the methane fracking and all of the oil they found. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas, but it's short-lived. It might only live for 20 years or so, or, but you can see, but it, it has an annual cycle here at, in Antarctica, and I'll show you, or in uh, Cape Grim, I'll show you some more of this. For a, a while, it was leveling out, and then it starts, now it's going up faster and faster and faster. And there's a number of reasons for that. Here's the Cape Grim record uh, in a slightly different scale, but, but let's just draw a straight line. Say the trend line went here. You see how much faster we're, we're adding CO2 than we used to? So it's just going up and then what's, where is this ever going to end? Is it, this has to stabilize at some point unless we're really locking ourselves into a lot of heating. And the um, Paris agreements want to try to stabilize this in X number of years uh, or at least slow this growth down. And that's going to be really important. Otherwise, we're going to have some very interesting climate effects. Not that the Earth hasn't had them before. It's just that mankind wasn't here when they did before. And our time scales, or our lifetimes generally, is how we measure things. And um, if we want to start measuring things in our great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren's time scale, we've got to start thinking what we're leaving them on how this is working. Now, look at this. This is a graph. This is the equator here. We'll do this a few times so you don't have to understand it the first time or the second. This is the equator. This is the South Pole. This is uh, Barrow, Alaska, which is the farthest north we can get, or Spitsbergen. And this is the CO2 cycle. Here's the years here, and it's going up. And you can see how it goes down in the spring because all of the vegetation in the northern hemisphere is pulling out CO2. Remember all the vegetations in the northern hemisphere and vegetation grows on what? Two things only. Water and CO2. Really nothing else. So all that CO2 gets sucked out of the atmosphere in the spring and summer and then in fall and winter we put more and more in from burning fossil fuels. But look at what happens in the southern hemisphere. Just certain places I can stand here. In the southern hemisphere, it's just an echo of what happens in the north. And Cape Grim uh, data is uh, right here. That's Cape Grim. And then you can see it. And we add more stations more, all the time. And over here, you can see the number of stations that are uh, got good data that make up this curve. And you can see they get more and more stations. But this is really interesting. This is the Mauna Loa Observatory annual cycle and the South Pole. And then as the years goes on, it, it will compress it. And you can see that it's the global carbon dioxide signal is very reflected all around the world. I mean, the whole atmosphere of the Earth is affected by what we're doing in the Northern Hemisphere. But isn't that neat how it goes up and down? That's the spring, fall, spring, or, uh, winter, summer, win winter, summer, winter, summer. It just keeps going. We'll do this once more. And we call this the skipping rope. You can see this is where this one is being held steady, and then on this end it's going up and down, up and down. How high is this going to go? That's the real question. And when are we going to slow it down, or are we? Um, I won't give you my personal opinions, but I'll show you uh, other data that uh, relates to this. This one here is Mauna Loa, Hawaii, which is the longest record on Earth of carbon dioxide going up. 
Now, if you look at three dimension, this is years along here from 205 on. Here's the equator, north, south, and this is the concentration. And the equator then comes right across here. You just come up from this until you hit the line and come across. There's the equator and there's Cape Grim. See how the earth inhales in the spring and summer? And then exhales in the fall, inhale, exhale. But each year, it's a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. But look at it in the southern hemisphere. It's, it's only an echo of the north because there's really no vegetation down here, relatively speaking. You know, Australia has vegetation around the edges, but there's not much in the middle. And um, I just love this graph. It, 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 it really shows what's going on in the earth. Here's the methane. It's a little bit different in that it, um, once the age of the methane that's being produced and worked up here gets down south, it, it, it doesn't go up as fast down here. But again, there's Cape Grim right there. Uh, the, the methane does come across the equator uh, better than the CO2. But you can see it is getting a little bit larger. But look at how big and con the concentrations are in the northern hemisphere compared to down here much, much less. And we can make probably 80 different graphs like this of different species. I'm just showing you two. We have so much data and probably 90% of it we never publish it. We make graphs, put it on the web and let other people work on it. Here's an interesting story. Global methane concentrations back to the 80s. You can see how they were really going up in the early 80s. Slowed down, leveled out, and now we're in an accelerating period. But within this period, there are times when the growth rate is much faster than other years. And one of these was in the late, or when the Berlin Wall fell down, Russia collapsed. They, oh, now for the next prize. Which country in the world until very recently produced the most natural gas? Who said that? Oh, you get a, sh no. Stand up, I want to see how big. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I've all I got left is a big one, but you'll have to change that, exchange that with somebody. Do you have any children by the chance? No. Because uh, <laughs> I have a nice child's uh, shirt here that uh, has a little slogan on it. It says, listen to Mother Earth. <laughs> but that's, this is for an eight or 10 year old child. So someone who has an eight or 10 year old child or grandchild uh, we'll, we'll let you win this later. Anyway, which country on earth until very recently produced the most oil? I don't hear many answers. No? Russia. Russia until recently produced more oil and more natural gas than any other country. And they shipped it all to Europe. That's where Europe gets their natural gas. Big pipelines. When they started falling apart here, their pipelines weren't repaired, their pumping stations weren't, and look, they started leaking. Enough to affect the whole world's atmosphere. We looked at this, and uh, we can look at the isotopes of the methane and oil burning, so tell where it's come from. All, every gas field and oil field has a signature on it. And you can separate out the differences between um, biological methane and primordial methane. And this was identified as coming out of the Russian pipelines that were leaking. Um, the Russians uh, at their wells were putting in X number of liters and then and Germany was paying them for X minus a lot. And they, after they shot a few people and put jailed a few for corruption, they realized these people weren't cheating them on the money. They were leaking instead of losing. So um, they, they were able to fix them. And look what happened to the growth rate. This isn't the total concentration, but the growth rate. <whistles> down to zero. And things were going on up and down a little bit. Uh, uh, plus or minus five is not a big deal. But when you start getting up to 10. Ruble, when the ruble collapsed, in 1997, 98, the economy went, a ruble was worth a dollar one night, and the next morning it was worth 10 cents. Their whole economy collapsed, and they never fixed their pipelines. Da, 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 da. They got things in control and fixed them. So these other little perturbations. Now, 
Um, the growth rate per year is kind of stabilizing, but it's still going up, very steady. And a lot of people have thought that this is related to one or two things, fracking and natural gas production in the U.S. and mainly, or melting of the Arctic permafrost. In the Arctic, there's huge, huge concentrations of methane and CO2 all in this area where there's where permafrost, because the permafrost, when it came, froze all the vegetation and these gases when it got cold into the 30 or 40 feet thick of permafrost. There's, there's, there's as much methane and CO2 up in here as has already been put out by burning of all the fossil fuels on Earth. So we could double our concentration of both of those gases if this ever starts melting. And a lot of people have thought it has, but we have no evidence that it is. Um, we do have evidence, of course, that things are going up. This is, and, I, and I'll get a little, tell you a little more about the methane in the Arctic in a minute. These are the carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, the two big greenhouse gases, and their, con and their concentrations um, 2000, from 2,000 years ago till now. And you say, well, how the hell can you measure 2,000 years ago? You just take an ice core, and the ice core has the air bubbles and catches the gas in there. You melt them, and you got the concentration. You see how steady they've been for the last 2,000 years? And right in here, something called the Industrial Revolution kicked in. Just look at it. And we're just, it's, it's amazing. We've passed 2,000 ppb for methane, and we've passed 400 for carbon dioxide. And look at, relative to the to this scale, what we're doing, how fast it's going up. Up to the ceiling. Now, how do we measure in Russia? Any way we possibly can. This is a station we've got running up in a really a tough place to get to. It, it's uh, on, near the Kolomo River, and then it's 30 miles inland over Muskeg. But we stuck this into the muskeg where everybody says it's melting and putting out methane. We, we got an old toilet or an old Russian house. You see a tank here? They have tanks that are very wide treads and we hauled this thing out in there, put up a tower, put up equipment. We have a seven kilometer um, extension cord down to a, a house where a hunter lives and he puts gas into the generator every day and we measure the methane. And th this looks very crude, and it is, but it, it doesn't matter if it's crude or not, it works. And the equipment is insulated, there's a tremendous insulation here to keep it warm in winters, and the instrument makes the heat, and the Russian pours the petrol in and makes it work on the other end. So we see no evidence that the Russian permafrost is melting, which is very encouraging. A lot of people have said it is, but we see absolutely no evidence. So where's the methane coming from? Strangely, it's coming from the Amazon basin. The, uh, there's more rain in the Amazon basin, and uh, if you know much about the Amazon basin, it's a, a very l flat basin, and as the water rises, it floods or not millions, tens of thousands of square miles. The tree leaves fall down, and the wood, and it gets in there, and they rot, and then you get more methane, and that methane is moving north. So it looks like it's coming from the Arctic, but really it's moving north from the tropics. And we can we watch it because we can see it in time through the network because we've got hundreds of sites instead of just a few, and we can see it moving. And we also can look at the isotopes and see that it's not natural gas from oil and gas fields. Kind of neat. This whole thing is kind of neat. But anyway, just look at this. The CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa, and then this is the PCO2, or the, uh, the concentration of CO2 in the oceans on a buoy that's out in the oceans. And you can see the trend lines are pretty much the same. Now, for somebody who's got a grandchild or a child, 8 to 10, for this shirt, when you mix CO2 and water, what do you get? Come on, everyone of you know that. Try out. Oh. Carbonic acid, give the man a shirt. Yes, the, the ocean is becoming more acidic because the CO2 goes, 
or give it to somebody who has one. The PCO, that's, you can't wear that's too small. The PCO2 or, the, or the, the CO2 is making carbonic acid because it has to go somewhere. The carbon dioxide has to go somewhere and it's going to all go into the oceans eventually because the oceans are a sink for it. It just takes a while. That's why if we stop putting out so much CO2, it'll level out and, and, and that because it's going into the ocean. Of course, people didn't really think what's going to happen in the ocean. What happens in the ocean, you get a change of acidity, you're getting more acidic, and now some of the plankton's starting to react adversely. It's hard for uh, baby clams to make their shells. It's, it's hard for certain plankton to make their shells because they're used to a certain acidity or changing acidity. We could, in a couple hundred years, collapse the whole uh, basic plankton cycle in the oceans. Some people are predicting that. I don't know, but we'll see. If you put all this together, what is it doing in the atmosphere heating? This is years across here on the bottom, and this is radiative forcing. But what's really important here is the annual greenhouse gas index. If you set it to zero at 1990, or one, let's say here, it doesn't matter, this is just to show you what's happening. But all, and this is the actual measurements of CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and then the other main gases, which are fluorocarbons. You can see since 1990, we have added 36% more eider down feathers to the atmosphere than were there in 1990. That's pretty amazing, and if we keep doing this, it's gonna be a real thick blanket one day. Okay, what is this doing to our atmosphere and the ocean? This is the global sea surface temperature, or average temperature on land, and you can see it's going up. Uh, this is from probably 10 million different measurements. Average sea level, da -da 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 -da. now it's going faster and faster and faster. And this, this is the scatters getting lower. Our, our measurements are getting better. And the northern hemisphere snow cover, the total amount of snow is going down. But let's look at Australia. These are from all of your tide gauges and from uh, satellite data from other countries. But look at, it's going up. And it's going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So if you own land that's a couple or half a meter above sea level, you might want to consider either putting a berm up or selling it or donating it to the Nature Conservancy or to the fish people or something. It's going to, and the storm surges are going to be higher. So what does Southern Australia, this area here, this is what CSIRO, Bureau of Meteorology, Monash University, da 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 da, all those people have put together. And this is what they say is going to happen here in the next 50 years or less. They guarantee it will happen in 50 years because most of them won't be around. So be checked. But uh, we can be pretty sure it's already happening. Hotter summer temperatures, drier years overall. On average, take, the, take it over five or 10 years, it'll be drier. But your rain will become more intense. The, one, the rains that do come will become more intense and you'll get more flooding and you'll get steady sea level rise. These are very high confidence uh, on those predictions. Um, they, remember we were talking about the Arctic ice? Well, here's what it looks like in 1979. See the ice extent? This was in, in the lowest period of, in the, in the late summer. That's where the ice would melt back to. Now, where is it melting back to? Look at that. And you can now take the Northwest Passage and take cruises all through the Arctic Basin as tourism. That's great for tourism. It's not so good for a lot of other things. Here's the amount of ice in the Arctic going down, 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 down. This year was the second lowest ever. It was the same as this year here. So this is down to here again. Next year, who knows? Probably lower. But the general trend is that it's melting. Now, let's have a really good story. You've all heard of the Antarctic ozone hole. Australia was pretty excited about that 20 years ago. Um, and then the countries of the world got together. They, they figured out that it was caused by these four main gases, CFC 11, 12, um, methyl chloroform, and carbon tet. They put the Montreal Protocol in. It kicked in in 1991. And look how fast the atmosphere responded. They didn't remove these chemicals. They didn't stop producing them. They slowed it down to what 
there was in one year, and then they slowed it down next, 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 and look at the atmosphere. Isn't that amazing? And the countries obeyed, and the ozone hole problem has essentially gone away, because these chemicals were going up, and, and they would collect around the Antarctica in something called a, a, a vortex, but the, the winds go round and around Antarctica, and then these chemicals in winter would come in and collect inside this bowl, and then in summer when the sunlight hit, the chemicals were there and they were with the ozone, and it's just like a, if this was a billion gallons of volatile gasoline. <laughs> Within 30 days, your ozone's gone, just like that. Boom! And right now we're into about the f about 15 days in the new in the new period, and the ozone's going down. Just, but it's not going to go as far. But before we leave this graph, look at that. Some, this methyl chloroform is the concentration in the atmosphere is almost unmeasurable. That's part per trillion. You know what a part per trillion is? Give me a visualization. It's easy. If you take Australian dollars and stack them from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head and make uh, something a fathom wide. Did you know this is a fathom measurement? Fishermen, you know, one fathom, because they're pulling a rope, two fathom. A fathom by a fathom by 250 kilometers long. That's from here to where? Anyway, 250 kilometers. There's one trillion Australian dollars in that. You take one of those dollars anywhere in that wall and put a scratch on it, we'll tell you exactly where you did and what side you scratched it on. And our accuracy, and, and the same with CSIRO, we have to be able to do that 99 times out of 100 and, and did that 20 years ago and 50 years from now, we have to do the same thing. That's what a part per trillion is. Really small. Anyway, every, all these gases went down except CFC-12. Why didn't it go down? You, every one of you know, absolutely, 100%. Refrigerators. 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 I don't have another shirt for you, but you're right. How often do you get a new refrigerator? Two years? I mean, twice in your lifetime? Three, four at most? The old ones stick around, they're still leaking, but they're starting to go down now because the, the gases are being exchanged. These are the gases that are now used. And they, but they all, of course, went up very fast because every time you make a chemical reaction or production, you lose something. So they started going up. This one was outlawed uh, uh, for developed countries um, in uh, 2000 and then immediately it started going down. And this is used as a, uh, in car air conditioners, among other things. And all of a sudden it starts going up again. Faster and faster and faster. Developing countries that weren't part of this agreement and some other countries found out that uh, people in the US and Canada would pay an awful lot for this gas so they wouldn't have to put a new compressor in their cars because the compressors that did this weren't allowed. It was cost a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars to put it in. They can buy on the black market something for 20. Why wouldn't they? So all it was, and then these countries found out it was cheaper and better and safer to do this than to raise cocaine because cocaine you could get shot or put in jail. For this you can't and it's more profitable. So now you can see it starting to left out, level out because the countries who do these measurements figured out finally where it was coming from. We can triangulate or use uh, different sites and eventually come right down. And we found a huge factory in northern Italy in Milan. The mafia was running a factory that was making this stuff. This. Now, the ozone in Antarctica, this is the total amount of ozone measured from the surface to the top of the atmosphere it was going down, 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 down. In 1997, it started coming back up. A little variation, but as long as you're going this way and coming up, that problem is solved. Amazing that we were able to change the atmosphere like that. Some other little interesting things. Um, for those of you who've been to China or know Beijing, and you're there in the spring or winter, and it can, you can hardly see the radio towers or the big 50-story hotel across the road. Two days later, you get up, beautiful. You can see the ski hills up on the, or the snow up on the mountains. What has happened is you've had a uh, this is Korea, Japan, 
China, you've had a dust front or a cold front come through. See this dust? That was mixed up in Mongolia and the Gobi Desert and came in in a front. But in front of it, see this stuff here? That's all pollution. The air should look clean like that. So you have this big snow plow. Oh, Australians, you know what a snow plow is, don't you? <laughs> yeah, this big snow plow comes down and pushes all this pollution out. And then behind it, it's beautiful and clean for a few days. But this pollution doesn't stop. It moves right across the Pacific. And if you've ever gone to Hawaii, you think you're in clean air, you're fooling yourself. Hawaii has 20 plus dust storms a year, pollution storms. And this is what one of them looks like. This is filters taken at Mauna Loa Observatory in April 1997. And in front of the front, you get all of this black material coming from uh, diesel engines and stuff. And that's, that was in this, that's this air here, the polluted. And then this air here, this mixture where you have pollution and dust, it looks like this. And then when the dust storm comes by, it looks just like that. And that's sample from here. That's this storm actually going, I think, or one like it. This is 201, this one is the other story. This is 97. Yeah, they come regular. Uh, doesn't matter. You get, this, you get the picture. Another place that's starting to become pretty important in this whole picture is India. The Indian economy is growing up a lot. Uh, this is India, Bangladesh, Tibet. See the Himalayan mountains here with the snow on them? In the summer, you see this kind of light gray here? And then it comes out over, that's air pollution. Air pollution runs just like water. If you know how water runs, you can just tell how air pollution runs because it moves in the cool air. And you can see it moves down the valley and then out into the uh, bay here. And the winter monsoon brings air from here down and helps push this out. The summer monsoon brings air up and pushes all this stuff into the Tibetan mountains and glaciers. And the glaciers are getting quite dark and that's causing them to melt faster. Now people in the agriculture like this because they're getting more water now. So you're getting more and more reliable and better water for your irrigation. But what happens? One day that tap is going to go from full on to dawdle to next year to off once that glacier stops melt or when it melts. So it's, it's Right now in India, for the most part, the irrigation is very good and it's going to stay that way for, who knows, 10, 20, 50 years, but one day, it's over. Well, I think we've run out of our time. Thank you very much for your attention. And we're open to any questions you want, scientific, social, financial. <laughs> when I do high school students, I get some really interesting questions. <laughs> Pardon me? Very slim. <laughs> and when the new government under Trump comes in, zero. <laughs> Isn't that scary? <laughs> Politicians, for the most part, a lot of, some of them are good, but some of them just don't want to hear anything like this. Because think about this, if we're going to cut CO2, it's going to cut our lifestyle or we're going to have to change things a lot. We're going to have to go to a lot of renewables. There's a lot of things going to have to change. And any, a little experience you all have every day, you ever go into a grocery store, a big grocery store, on a, and then go to the food where they have all the frozen food, but it's open, and the cold air is coming on, you're shivering like the Dickens there. And that's a lot of energy. And then they have the heater going on at the front of the store to keep it warm. And, all kinds of things like this we'd have to change. But we went to an interesting uh, location near here where they're learning how to sequester carbon. They're taking carbon dioxide and pumping it down deep and sequestering it in different layers. And eventually we'll probably be having to do that for power plants and refineries and the big sources. Go for the big easy ones. Power plants, refineries, big industrial areas. Take that carbon dioxide. Stick it down. That would make a big difference in that trend line. But it's going to take a, a, an expense. It's going to be high. Are we willing to pay something now 
that isn't going to affect us really beneficially or our children, but maybe our grandchildren? Are we willing to do that, really? Let's be honest. Yes, some of us are, but not to the point where we'd take a half, half our salary and give it to somebody to, to work on that. I probably wouldn't, even though I should. I mean, let's just be honest here. But the, some of those decisions are going to have to be made. Unless we want to live with, with the climate change. It's not that mankind will die out. It's just our patterns of life will change a bit. And there'll be some parts of the world will really be stressed. Whereas rich countries like Australia and the US and Canada won't really be stressed. We'll complain a lot. But it won't be like the Sahil where they'll be dying. Or some places in uh, Mexico and places uh, where, where you have expanding deserts and less rain. But again, it's, it's something that we, it's a qualitative decision we'll have to make soon. The sooner the better. I was interested in your um, show where the measurements around the world are. And India to be quite free of actual measurements. Yes, there's some countries, uh, India in particular, will not let us measure there. Or they won't measure and tell what we did. We had an agreement one day. We were signed up. We were set it. And then somebody said, oh, you can do isotopes. Ding! They stopped. They really, they were within 10 minutes of signing it. And they, isotopes, isotopes triggered the idea of nuclear weapons, things like that, spying. <coughs> we had two stations all ready to go in India. Um, there's South America. We don't have many stations. Uh, some of the countries do, but it's so difficult to get, like those flasks, to get them into... Argentina or somewhere, you have to pay two people under the table, and then when it comes out, they take and they open them up and sniff to see what's in them. It's impossible. So, we uh, there is gaps in our knowledge, but hopefully they'll they'll fill in eventually. No, about six days later. Now, imagine that you were burning on fossil fuels, it's only going to stop once it's all gone. So, is there anything that changes the picture depending on the speed? Yes, if, if you cut down the speed at which you use it, the oceans are picking up a lot and, and they'll slow it down. And, and that's the Nobody thinks that we're going to stop using fossil fuels, but if we can just slow it down a little bit now, we've taken out some of the, we haven't added those extra feathers to the bed, and so we'll get less heat in the longer term. So it gives us more time to, to develop alternative energies, to develop um, mitigation activities, to breed better crops that take less water and more heat, things like that. So every, every thousand tons of CO2 you don't put in the atmosphere, you buy yourself a little more time. You're paying for this shot. You can talk as much as you want. The Amazon. So something is changing. Something is changing in the Amazon. Yeah. Now originating. So, so what's the story? The, the, there's more rainfall. Um, let me give you uh, one minute on how climatology works. It's so simple. People make climatology climate be hard, but it's terribly simple. Most of the energy coming into the Earth comes in at the equator. It heats up and the air rises. So it rises at the equator, goes out, and then it settles down at 30 degrees north and south. So if you're getting more energy in now, you're getting more clouds going up. Faster, that makes more rain. It's raining down on the Amazon. And the Amazon's the only place on Earth where there's really large vegetation on the equator. There's not that much in Africa. This is... They've cut most of it down, but there's a very small amount. South Africa has a lot of desert and dry. This is all desert and dry. So the real vegetation, and this is flat, basically in here. After you get away from the Andes, it, it, it's just flat, so it floods. You get the flooding, more trees are decaying, and the leaves from the trees are getting under the water. The minute you get them underwater, they decay anaerobically, they produce methane. It's very quick. You get a real heavy rainfall period for a while, one year, 
you can see the methane right away because the leaves fall down, start decaying. What about the increased logging? Yeah, the increased logging is pretty dramatic, but there's still a lot of vegetation left, and it's slowing down. But again, we're changing the atmosphere, or, or in land a lot. Australia used to have a lot of trees in certain areas. Now you've got beautiful big paddocks and a lot of cows in there. You know, you've, you've cut a lot of trees out of there. And, but in, in South America, they were doing it almost unconscionably, but they've slowed that down now. In Brazil, they've got some pretty strong laws. But we're changing the whole world, aren't we? I mean, the, just the fact that we're here in a building that this was once vegetation or green grass or something, you know? So the more population, the more building, the more consumption, the more changing of the earth. Yeah, uh, blue carbon uh, is a study in where they're along, especially along coasts where vegetation uh, in the oceans can um, take up more carbon and you could probably fertilize it and stuff. But my personal feeling is it's, it's, it, it doesn't take out enough. It, 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 there's a lot of carbon dioxide out there. And if you take it out here, there's still a lot more. One final thing that I meant to tell you, you know, you look at all this ocean water, where are all the fish in there? So a lot of the ocean doesn't have many fish. There's a lot of places you can try to get fish and there's just nothing there. Most of the ocean does not have fish or, or enough fish that we would want to go uh, get them. They're, they're along here. Most of the US fish are on the Alaska. There's fish along the coast. There's fish around Antarctica, but different countries are exploiting that. I think Australia is trying to help control fishing certain species and stuff. There's a toothfish or something that's very valuable around there. It's really interesting, though, what we're doing to the earth, and, and we've got to learn to live with it and adapt, I think. That's probably what we, you know, we, we can't shut our minds and say that we aren't changing it because we are, but it would be good, nice if we changed it just a little bit slower, or a little bit, you know, and to keep slowing it down a bit. No, and just in this case, the way the Himalayas or Himalayas form and the countries that up, uh, you get some from Pakistan too, but um, basically that's uh, a lot of the burning of the brown biomass. It's, it's biomass burning in India a lot, but now it's shifting. But, but you, you burn a lot of vegetation, you burn a lot of cow dung, uh, a lot of wood, and, and that's, uh, it's called brown aerosol more than anything. But it's really, in India there, and then when the summer monsoon, it, the air moves up, as you know, into the Himalayas, and it rains and snows, but it all washes out on the glaciers. Okay, well, I think that, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Senator for putting on the public lecture. And I think that what you all found it very fascinating, and I think that um, you made, again, the subject very reachable and approachable, and so uh, I think Thank you, Dr. I will download all of these slides on the computer here, and I'm sure someone can put them on someplace where you can get. There's, there's nothing secret in here, nothing proprietary. Use it as best you can. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, everybody. You're welcome. So you're welcome.